And we're back for part two of our Class B amplifier investigation. So here we have a little circuit. This is sort of where we left off last time. Um, we want to run through this with some numbers, see what we get out of it. There's a couple items we need to uh, investigate that we didn't look at in the first video. Number one, the ratings of the transistors. Okay, what, what are we looking at in terms of the power rating of the transistor, the maximum current rating for the transistor, the maximum voltage rating. All right, so on a, on a data sheet, for example, you know, we'd be looking for the breakdown voltage, BVCEL. I'd be, oops, I'd be looking for the IC max value. All right, what's the maximum current on this thing? I'd want to know what the PD max is. What are they? Well, the breakdown voltage turns out to be the entire power supply. This might not be immediately obvious. You know, if you think in terms of the load line that we had, and we said, okay, we're going to take for our AC load line, we're going to run this thing like this. The Q point's going to be all the way down here at um, cutoff, and we said that the cutoff voltage was equal to the half the power supply. So, if, for example, we had uh, 15 volts here and minus 15 volts here, we would say, okay, that's 15 volts. That's my VCEQ. So you might think that's the maximum. And in the on state, that is true, because as this starts to conduct more, right, if we have a positive input, the NPN is going to start to conduct, pushing current into load, the voltage across the transistor shrinks, right? I mean, this is a KVL. You've got a total of 15 volts here. So some of it is on the transistor, some of it is across the load. As we pump more current through here, the load voltage grows and what's left over for the transistor shrinks, okay? Um, the worst case actually occurs when the transistor is off. So continuing with the idea of the positive current, if we push this thing all the way up, right, the operation point goes all the way to saturation, then this transistor, the NPN, its voltage is virtually zero, right? It's maybe a tenth, two tenths of a volt sitting across here. Well, at that point, the emitter is at nearly 15 volts. Well, this emitter is the emitter of the PNP. So there you go. You got 30 volts sitting across this transistor when it's off. So the breakdown voltage would have to equal the entire power supply. All right, so in this case, that would be 30 volts. What's the IC max rating for the transistor? Well, that would occur when this thing is right at saturation. In other words, you take your full power supply, your compliance, your peak compliance, and you would divide it by your load. Okay? So let's say we had an 8 ohm resistor out here. Now, the compliance on this thing remember, that's the uh, the peak-to-peak -peak compliance is the full power supply, right? The peak compliance is equal to the single power supply over here. So the compliance on this thing is equal to 15 volts. That's the biggest swing we're going to get. Well, that 15 volts drops across our load. So we can say that the IC max value, the biggest current we're ever going to see through that transistor, without some kind of crazy fault, which we'll get to in a sec, um, the biggest current we're ever going to see through there is going to be that voltage, right? Your your peak compliance divided by whatever your load impedance is. All right. So in this case, that's going to be 15 volts peak divided by 8 ohms. All right. That's just a little less than um, 2 amps. As a matter of fact, it's 1.8. 8. eight amps, right? So that's the biggest current we're going to see in there. Think of it this way. It is your IC sat, right? That's your IC max for the transistor rating. All right. Now the power dissipation. Well, the proof of the power dissipation is fairly long. It is in the text. Um, it's a little too long for us to go through here. And I'll just give you the final answer. 
which is that this is equal to your p load max divided by 5. Now there's a caveat with that, which is that that assumes we have a purely resistive load and we're not overdriving the amplifier. In fact, um, with a real reactive load like a loudspeaker, especially if you overdrive it, the power dissipation requirements on the transistor can be higher than P load over max. Um, the impedance of a real loudspeaker that's, let's say, ideally 8 ohms, you know, nominally 8 ohms, at certain points in the frequency spectrum could be half that value. So the current goes up, the power goes up, um, you know, so on and so forth. All right. All right, so we'll have to hold on this for a second until we actually figure out our, um, our power. All right, so let's continue with what we have here. Um, I'm going to put a couple of maybe uh, 200 ohm resistors over here on the input. So I think we're pretty much done with values. Um, what do we have for a gain? All right, what do we have for an input impedance? Let's get those out of the way, and then we'll focus on our power. Well, the gain on these things is always eh, approximately 1. That's a voltage follower, right? The input's on the base, the output's on the emitter. You know, ideally, it would be the load divided by the load plus R prime E, but once again, we just think of R prime E as being a distortion mechanism. And a well-designed amplifier, that should be a really small value compared to the load. All right, so we just say, eh, it gains virtually 1. You know, maybe it's really 0.97 or something, but close enough for us. We'll just say it's... It's unity. Remember, it's in phase. It's a follower. So if this is the input phase, this is the output phase. Right? So we should just see the same size signal in sync with the input. Input impedance. All right, so looking in here, the diode impedance we can assume to be zero. So what we see is this 200 and that 200 both going to an AC ground. All right, so that pair obviously will give us 100 ohms. And that's going to be in parallel with one of the two Z in bases. Remember, only one transistor is on at any given time. So it's not like we see two of these things in parallel, only one of them. On the positive half wave, the NPN's on. So we're going to see its Z in base on the negative half wave. The PNP is on. Right? The NPN will be off, meaning it's not conducting, so there's no base current. So what do we have for those Z and bases? Well, ideally, the Z and bases are equal to beta times your R load, your RE. Now, power transistors tend to have smaller betas than small signal transistors. So, you know, a small signal transistor, you might have a beta of 150 or 200. Power transistor, you know, might be 50 or 40, okay? So, just to throw some numbers in here, let's just say the betas for these two transistors are 50 each. All right, that would be a little bit more uh, realistic, perhaps. So, our, our Z in base would be, uh, say, 50 times this RL of 8 ohms, nominal 8 ohms. All right, that's going to get us uh, 400 ohms. So, I'm going to put that in parallel with my 100 over here. All right, that's a 4 to 1 ratio, so we're going to get 4 fifths of that combo and the Zn four-fifths of a hundred is 80 ohms. All right. That's what this source sees. It sees basically ten times whatever the load is. All right. Great. Now, we could play with the values of these 200s if we sort of built this in lab and started the monkey with it. We could play with the values of these 200 ohms which would change this biasing current change the current through the diodes, and therefore change the trickle bias that's going down through our two transistors. Increasing that current turns it on a little bit more. The notch distortion should fall back a little bit, right? Mitigate the notch distortion. Um, downside of that is the smaller resistors here are going to decrease the input impedance. So we kind of have to play with this a little bit. Well, in the book there are uh, some techniques that are discovered um, how to improve this situation, but for now we'll just kind of stick with this, right? There's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, you can unfortunately go a little too far with this. Um, as we'll see shortly, there's nothing to limit output current if you went too far with these resistors, if you made them too small. In any case, getting back to our uh, power calculation, right? I want to find out what P-load max is. 
So we have to take our compliance, turn that into an RMS value, square it, divide by your load impedance. So we've got 15 volts peak, multiply that by your RMS fudge factor 0.707. Square that divided by 8 ohms. So your compliance, right, is going to be a little over uh, 10 volts. It's actually, you know, if you, if you do this, you're going to get about um, 10.6 volts RMS. All right, so you take 10.6 volts RMS, you square it, you divide it by 8 ohms. Your P load max is going to turn out to be 14 watts. Okay. Not a huge amount of power, but um, you know you're not going to you're not going to be filling uh, a gymnasium, you know, with a PA with 14 watts. But that's not a bad amount of power. I mean, for just normal kinds of things that you would be listening to, unless you're trying to listen to something at the uh, concert level, um, 14 watts is a sufficient amount of power for most applications. If just listening to music or something, I mean, the power out of um, let's see your telephone receiver. Uh, the um, your cell phone um, or maybe uh, a table radio something like that a television the built-in part not if you have a very fancy you know media setup um, you're not going to get 14 watts on something like that all right you know headphones you're going to be measuring powers in the milliwatts you know maybe hundreds of milliwatts you're not going to be seeing something like that in any case now that we know what the P load max is we could turn around and find out what our ideal power dissipation is. PL uh, max divided by 5. So I got 14 watts divided by 5. And what we're saying is um, 2.8 watts per transistor. A class A amplifier, if I was going to build a class A amplifier that was um, producing 14 watts to its load, and it was at its theoretical maximum of 25% efficiency, right? This would represent one quarter of the total. In other words, we need about um, 56 watts coming in, and only 14 of that would be turning into uh, useful output power. Now, the balance of that, right, you know, some 40 some odd watts, a lot of that's gonna get burned up in the transistor itself. As a matter of fact, Typically, we'd be looking at a factor of 10 to 1. In other words, a Class A amplifier would probably be needing at least 28 watts for its output device, all right? Just as a rule of thumb. So we have a huge advantage over here. These smaller transistors um, are going to be much less expensive. There's going to be less heat to dissipate. There's all kinds of uh, uh, advantages associated with this, all right? Now, what we see here with this power dissipation being directly related to the load power, anything that would increase the load power will increase the dissipation demand. Well, what if I went in here, 8 ohms is a very common value for home loudspeakers. In a car, 4 ohms is very common. If I threw 4 ohms in here, I'm going to wind up doubling this power. This is going to go to 28 watts. And of course, if this is 28 watts, then this gets doubled as well. We're going to be looking at 5.6 watts. And we could go further and further. Hey, I'll take two 4 ohm loudspeakers and put them in parallel. I've got two ohms. Oh, look, I got 56 watts now into the two loudspeakers combined. This thing jumps up to 11.2 watts. There's a trend going on here. You're getting more power to the load, but you're going to draw more current from the uh, power supply. So, guess what? This current's going up as well. Voltage swing, the BVCEO still stays what it is, but the current's going up, the power's going up. You know, where do we end? Well, obviously, we end when the transistor expires. Well, here's an insidious little problem. What if in the process of building this circuit, you accidentally short the load? Or for that matter, suppose that you, you, know, you have this amplifier, it's, it's in a consumer product, and the um, consumer, they're taking their loudspeaker wires and maybe one of the strands of the loudspeaker wire accidentally becomes undone and it shorts to the other wire. 
This is the situation you have. You have a dead short. What is in this circuit to limit current? Nothing. The DC load line for this circuit goes like this. It's straight up. There's nothing to limit the current. So you do that, and boom, you blow up these transistors. So how do we prevent that from happening? What sort of safety valve can we put in here? Well, there's a various numbers of things uh, discussed in the text. One very simple thing to do is to put a fuse in line here. All right, if the current gets too big, the, uh, you know, the fuse will blow. Okay, you put that on the inside, obviously. Um, and then if the, if the consumer did, in fact, uh, accidentally short the wires, the fuse blows, it protects the amplifier, and they just have to understand, okay, you know, put another fuse in there, I have to double check the wires. Another thing you can do is stick the fuse back here in the um, power supply runs. Let's face it, if a consumer can get to it, the consumer might decide that, hey, I've run out of 2-amp fuses, so um, I'll put a 5-amp fuse in. Or a 10-penny nail, right? Or the spring from a big pen, something like that. You know, and of course, that thing winds up with a 200-amp you know, limit on it before it melts, and the transistors are going to die way before that. So we don't want that to happen. So if we had fuses maybe back here, even if the consumer did something kind of goofy, um, we would prevent any catastrophic failure right, by having fuses back here. Fuses are kind of inconvenient in some regards because you, know, you have to go and replace them. There are other techniques. There are active techniques that are discussed in the text. Uh, we'll leave that for some other time. Um, but I do want to look at some variations on the theme here. Right? You don't always use a split power supply. It's, it's possible to configure this particular circuit with a single power supply. It's not quite as advantageous, but you know, sometimes you're stuck. You only have a single polarity power supply. So what do you do? How do I analyze this? So here's basically the same thing with a single polarity power supply. Now if I wanted the same power, the same currents and so forth, this would have to be a 30 volt power supply. All right, so I have a total of 30 in both of these circuits. Here's my output, and there's my input. I'm going to need coupling capacitors. Right? It's no longer the case that these points, you know, as in the original circuit, are at ground. So I need some coupling capacitors. Here's my source, here's my load. This is a huge disadvantage, this capacitor in particular, because it's coupling a fairly low impedance. So it needs to be a fairly large capacitance value, you know, maybe hundreds of microfarads. And it has to be rated you know, up around half the power supply, because ideally this point right here is going to be half the total power supply. Right? And the circuit, that's going to be 15 volts DC. So that's what appears across the coupling capacitor, because you don't want any DC across your load. But this configuration will work. You know, if you've got the same voltage supply, total, same resistors, same load, this thing is going to analyze out exactly the same way that the first one did. Right? But if you have a split power supply, you get to save on these components. And like I said, this one in particular is large and expensive. So this is a huge advantage if you can do it this way. All right? Okay. I think that's a sufficient amount of exercise for today.